please welcome Carlo Ratti, director, MIT Sensible City Lab, and Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, very <laughs> fabulous to see people in the audience, people virtually as well. And I'm very excited to say that this is going to be your morning espresso. This man has so much energy. I've had so much exciting times prepping to have a conversation with him. <laughs> Carlo Ratti is, of course, of MIT. <clears throat> and Sensible City Lab, we were just seeing some fabulous video there of the work you've done, first and foremost, with what cities are evolving to at the moment. Right here, right now, how many sizable cities are being formed every few weeks, but not as usual cities as we know them. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right, Carolyn. Uh, as you know, you know, today is a big moment for urbanization. Um, there's many statistics. You can say, you know, in New London, canvases form every few weeks. It means people from, from rural areas move to urban areas or across the planet, you know, in the millions every few weeks. Uh, but few people know, actually, that many of those cities look like what we just saw look like informal settlements, favelas, you know, favelas in Brazil, Rocinha, the one you saw, one of the largest one in, in South America. And so one of the key challenges is really how can, we, how can we weave in some of those settlements more into the formal urban fabric. And if you think about Rocinha, for instance, you know, one of the issues, not even Amazon is able to deliver there, simply because you don't know enough about the structure, about the streets, about really the urban fabric. And so the idea here is by making it visible, by understanding it, by mapping, by using all the data you just saw, 300,000 points every second collected from the favela, then we can start actually making part of the broader urban fabric. Told you. One shot of espresso, Dan. We're going to get quadruple in this 12-minute time we have with you. So how has, for example, the, the way in which favelas or informal settlements or shanty towns, whatever way we know them, how has the monitoring them changed during COVID, if at all? How are we seeing it become a reality that we can start to make sure that they're serviced more, that the infrastructure is more efficient? Yeah, and, and, uh, and you're right. You know, remember this, you know, two years ago, we were saying cities are over, cities are dead. You know, everybody was saying we'll all live in the countryside. Well, you know, luckily that, uh, that was not the case, actually one, some of our voices were some of the dissenting voices saying, you know, cities, cities, you know, cities start around 10,000 years ago. We didn't have cities before. And then humanity discovers this beautiful way to bring us together so that together we can be more than each of us individually. And that's when cities emerge in this part of the world, in Mesopotamia, in other parts of the world. And, uh, and that's really the magic of a city, to bring us together, to make sure that we can share ideas, goods, products, chromosomes, you name, you name it. And, and that applies in the formal city and the informal city. Now, yes, uh, COVID was threatening the urban fabric. People were thinking cities were over. Well, we're seeing today that actually physical encounter is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And it's important today, now when we meet at the Bloomberg event, is important in cities, is important in the offices. That's really where we build the social fabric that we require to, to live. I'm a social person. I feel that. My sister is someone who thrives being a little more antisocial, and she rather enjoyed the work from home. What is the data that you're looking at that means that it is far better that we are not connecting just virtually, that we are here in the flesh, building networks, having conversations? Because I know that you've got a paper leading to this at the moment. Yes, um, we have a paper. It's a piece of research we're doing at MIT. We collaborated with, uh, with a number of researchers, including Robin Dunbar. Some of you may recall the, the Dunbar number. You know, how we as humans, Again, in a way that is similar to what monkeys do, uh, we connect with a certain number of friends, and the number number describes those kind of stable interactions we, we can form. And so in this paper, what we've been doing, we've been looking at the MIT campus, looking at what happened before COVID, what happened during COVID, and also how things change again once we went back to physical space. And you know, what you find is, uh, is important, is that physical space is an antidote to polarization. Physical space is what allows us to create what sociologists call weak ties. You know, connection bridges to other communities. In physical space, is really where this happens, which doesn't happen in digital space, where we actually tend to divide, to segregate. And so, again, you know, one more reason why it is so important to be back in the city in public space, or for the matter, here, all of us together. After this conversation, we're going to be thinking about the way in which cities need to be built from an equitable perspective. But your, your training, your, your 
all of your learnings and expertise as an engineer, as an architect as well. How are we going to form cities differently so that that networking is only positive for us? Yeah. And, and you know, architects and engineers can play a big role here in terms of the overall sustainability of cities. Now we're talking about social sustainability, but also sustainability in general. By the way, remember just four numbers about cities, 255, 75, and 80. Cities are only 2% of the surface of the planet, but are 55% of the population, 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. Wow. So as uh, designer, architects, planners, we've got a big, big responsibility in order to make our cities more sustainable, again, from an environmental point of view and also from a social point of view. Going back to your point, you know, what can we do from a social point of view? Well, it's about bridging those invisible fault lines that we can detect in cities. How can we do it? The first thing, big data help us today to understand better those ghettos. We call them liminal ghettos. You know, the ghettos in the past were visible. Today, they're even more insidious because you don't see them. You need kind of an augmented eye with digital data in order to understand these kind of fractures in the city. And then when we know that, we can actually design things in order to bridge schools, parks, public spaces, you name it. All of those can actually help us to make sure the city performs as it should as something that brings us together. You say all of this at a time where many of us, many of us feel politically speaking, certain cities, certain countries have never been more divided. Can cities in some way be an antidote to that? Yeah, I, I really hope so. I'm also very concerned about the situation we are living in different countries. Myself, I spent a good chunk of my life in the United States, in other countries, and you see this polarization that many people have linked to social media. We go on social media, we get passionate about uh, and then you know, we divide, we separate, and at one point we don't even have any more common facts to share common things that glue us together. And I think physical space is an antidote. Physical space is, has an important thing. You know, it's so easy. On digital space, you go there, you unfriend somebody. You say something I don't like, you know, you're gone. You know, I don't, don't listen to what you post anymore. There's something in physical space which is inevitability. In physical space, you have to confront it. We need to constantly negotiate with other people. We need to challenge people who might challenge our preconception. Now, think about it, about the following. I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to make it, like I say, you know, I, I don't have many people in my digital network who were supported of the former U.S. president, uh, Donald Trump, but when I just go in the streets, even in a liberal city such as Boston or New York, then I meet many supporters. So somehow, physical space, I believe, can be an antidote to this polarization. It forces us to, again, to challenge our preconceptions and uh, think and confront uh, diversity. However, we come out of this two-year experiment that we we're all forced into of yeah. virtual living, more so in developed nations than in developing, but, and more so in white collar, to use a different, for want of a better phrase, jobs rather than blue collar. Yeah. But there seems to be certain companies, for example, Facebook's rebranded itself as Meta. They're thinking very much about how we can have an augmented reality, maybe not fully virtual, do you think that that will live on? Do you think, how do you see the balance of us coming into the city three days a week and then having more useful experiences in our Zoom rooms or whatever mm -hmm. virtual meetings it might be in an augmented or virtual reality? Yeah, well, for sure we want to be flexible. So some flexibility we're going to, to enjoy that flexibility. Maybe working one, two or three days per week from home, you know, commuting a bit less, be more productive, spending more time in the countryside with the family, you name it. Um, but at the same time, I'm a bit concerned about Meta. First of all, you know, Meta reminds me of, uh, remember that experiment, Second Life, you know, something totally unrelated from physical world? And people got very excited for a few years, and then, poof, you know, it disappeared. Did what? anyone use Second Life? Show of hands. Anyone remember building, buying? One person, at least. <laughs> <laughs> well done, ahead of your time. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, that was like 10 years ago. And, uh, and what has changed? Yes, we got more bandwidth. Yes, we got, you know, different type of vision system. But it seems to me it's the same problem. You know, we, we live in physical space. The coffee you mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't work on meta. You know, it works here when we're all together. And that's the way magic of human interaction happens and the magic of the city starts. Feels like you're optimistic about cities. In an, are you optimistic about <clears throat> these more temporary or informal settlements as well and, and how they develop and how we serve them. And because we're at a time of not just polarization, but growing inequality, many would feel. 
Well, you know, I, 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 maybe the, the best way is to answer with the words of Karl Popper, who said optimism, optimism is a duty. I think it's a duty because the future is not set in stone. It's not something to predict. Actually, the future will come out of what we will decide. So actually, if you want to improve cities, if you want to improve favelas, if somebody from this room, getting out of this room, comes up with some idea that might change whatever, Latin American city and so on, well, you know, that's the way to build a better future. And that's why it's a duty to, to be optimistic. Where do you think the balance will be in, in terms of the way we live? Do you see a three, five day? Do you see, a, or is that just for the, for the lucky? I, I mean, in, I'm seeing different things, but you know, I believe you live in New York, and you know, I've been spending quite a bit of time in New York, in London. You know, He's you, actually an international man of mystery. Apparently lives in about five cities, always traveling. <laughs> that, that, that was before COVID, you know, not anymore. But, uh, um, but uh, the point if you, if, you, if you look at the global cities, you know, what Saskia Sasset would call these kind of global cities, what you see is that people still want their flexibility. And yes, it's maybe two days per week working from home, working from another place. So I think we'll keep it. But the important thing is that when we come together, and we come together at an event like this one, we come together in the office, we have a coffee together, you know. When we meet in physical space, the important thing is that then is when we need to, to build those weak ties, we need to build those new links that actually sustain our social networks. So one call to the audience, one thing you'd love to see to ensure that this optimism, this, this coming together, this sharing of caffeinated beverages <coughs> becomes a reality. Um, well, maybe have more coffee. I think coffee actually, <laughs> coffee actually is, uh, has been proven as you know, promoting some of the dynamics we, we are saying. And so maybe that's a good way to, to end. There speaks a good Italian. He might be an international man of mystery, but still has his roots. We thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating, of course, of MIT the, uh, and, and the Seeable uh, City Lab. We thank you, Carlo Thank you, Karen. Thank you all.